Many of you know Vicki and I took a, a brief uh, vacation last week, and I appreciate all of your, your kind words. It actually was the first time that just her and I had been away for uh, a long time, and so it was great just for the two of us to spend time together. She fell in love with me all over again and, and was reminded why she married me. We did have one little problem. One night I picked a restaurant she didn't like, and you can see she punched me in the mouth, and so, but... <laughs> But we got beyond that. We worked beyond that. And uh, now it, it was great to get away. And I'm so appreciative of our team and our staff that, that does such a great job that I don't have to be here. I heard Brad did a great job with the message as he always did. And so we appreciate him and, and his uh, gifting that God has given to him. So take your Bibles with me today and turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Actually, Habakkuk chapter 1. In chapter 2, we're going to go back and look at just a few of the verses even that we saw last week. So let me ask you today, did you ever have a prayer request that God didn't answer? Think about that for just a second. Something for which you prayed and God didn't answer. Now, I'm not talking about silly things today. I'm not talking about the fact that you know, you bought a lottery ticket, and on your way away, you said, okay, God, help me to win the lottery, and he didn't help you win the lottery. And uh, I'm not talking about if you're a student, you know, you didn't study for your test, and you say, okay, God, help me to remember all the answers that I didn't study, all right? Those are, those are silly prayers. Or maybe even you prayed for your football team to win, all right? Even though I would say today that the Dolphins desperately need our prayers, um, But that's a point for a different day. No, I'm talking about a serious request for which you prayed. Your burden was heavy. And you cried out to God for God to answer your prayer. Maybe you prayed for a loved one to be healed. And God didn't heal them. That loved one might have passed away. Maybe you prayed for God to provide the funds to to save your house, and it didn't happen. You lost your house. Maybe you asked God to help you keep your job, and you were let go. Or maybe you prayed for your marriage to be restored, but it ended in divorce. Or you prayed for your kids to not walk away from the Lord, and unfortunately now they're completely disconnected from their faith. All of those things are tough. You may be asking yourself, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? God, God, did you hear me? God, God, are you ignoring me? God, do you even care? I'm sure all of us, or most of us, have been at that place in our lives. Vicki and I have. Many of you know that we have a disabled daughter, a 25-year-old disabled daughter. For 25 years, we've prayed for God to heal Amber. And as of yet, he's chosen not to do so. I believe he can. I believe he has the power to to do it, but he's chosen not to do so. We've prayed for Amber to stay healthy. Those of us that are part of our family here know that last year, Amber broke both of her hips and spent a lot of time in the hospital. We pray for her comfort on a regular basis, and yet she suffers with chronic pain. And as a dad, as parents, we ask God, why do you allow her to continue to suffer? God, do you hear our prayer? God, do you answer our prayers? All of us have been there at one point or another in our lives. That's what Habakkuk deals with in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. As Brad mentioned last week, that, that the, the, the genre of this book is a lament. And we talked about laments just a few months ago, if you remember, as we went through our series on prayer. A lament is when a person literally cries out and complains, as it were, to God, bears their soul to God. And we see Habakkuk doing that repeatedly throughout this book. 
And in the passage that we're looking at today, that we're going to look at in just a few moments, Habakkuk actually laments for two things. One of them Brad mentioned last week, and it's this. How can God use wicked people to accomplish a divine purpose? As found in the passage that we're looking at today. Notice, if you have your Bible, your phone in front of you, in verse 13 of chapter 1, he says this, God, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Did you ever see that going on in the world? I mean, it seems like the wicked prosper while the godly suffer. And we sit back and say, hold on, God, that just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. You're in good company. Habakkuk makes the exact same lament. But the other thing that he cries out in these first two chapters is this. God, why are you not answering my prayers? God, why is it when I cry out to you, you don't respond? We see that. Brad showed that last week in chapter 1 and verse 2. Notice the words of Habakkuk. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or I cry out to you, God, violence and you will not save. God, when are you going to answer my prayer? How do we respond to that? How do we respond when we, when we desperately want God to do something or we desperately need for God to do something? And it's as if heaven is silent. It's as if God does not respond. And we feel like God is not listening to us, let alone answering us. Well, in the verses that we're going to look at today, Habakkuk tells us, how to respond to that situation. And I've given you just a main thought from the very beginning. So here's the main thought that we're going to address. Whenever that happens in our lives, here's how we should respond. We should live like we believe it, even though we don't see it. Does that make sense? So, so when God is silent, when the path is dark, when we're not sure what God is doing, when we want to throw in the towel and give up, how should we respond at that moment? When we don't understand, as we saw last week, what God is doing, how should we respond? We should live like we believe it, even though we don't see it. Let me show you one verse, and we'll have a word of prayer today in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And we're going to look at the latter part of chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2 today. But the key verse in our text is Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And I want to read that and lay the foundation and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll move on. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. God is is responding to Habakkuk's second complaint. And God says this, and we'll look at the whole response, but he says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But notice this phrase. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Would you read that last phrase with me? Let's read that together. Would you read that? But the righteous shall live by his faith. Let's read it one more time, will we? But the righteous shall live by his faith. Here's the message. I'm going to give it to you before we ever start, and then we'll flesh out the verses. Here's what God is telling Jeremiah. When you don't know what I am doing, when you don't see your prayers answered, when you want to throw in the towel and think that I have forgotten you, it is at that moment that the righteous man and the righteous woman truly demonstrates their faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Would you pray with me today? Father, we, we long to hear from you. Lord, there are situations in our life that we just don't understand. And we cry out to you at times for relief. 
We cry out to you at times for answer. And thank you that at times you do graciously answer. And there are times in our life when we definitely see the hand of God in our life. But we have to admit that there's other times in our life when we pray and we don't hear from you. We ask you to provide and the provision doesn't come. We ask you to heal and at least in this life the healing doesn't come. We ask for you to work, and it says, if you're silent in our lives. God, help us to learn today from Habakkuk how we respond to those moments in our lives. And teach us, increase our faith as the disciples prayed, Lord, increase our faith. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, so Habakkuk teaches us two things that I want us to see, two extremely simple yet extremely profound truths in this passage of Scripture. So when our prayers don't get answered, what are we to do? If you have your outline in front of you, the first response is this, wait on God. So when, so when we pray and God doesn't answer, when something's happening that we don't understand, what is our response? Our response, very simply, is to wait. Now, you're probably looking at the most impatient person in our congregation, all right? I'm incredibly impatient. Am I impatient, Vicki? A little bit. She's being really gracious. I'm really impatient. I hate to wait. I get impatient waiting at the doctor's office. I mean, there's been times that I've waited, and when I wasn't seen in the time that I thought I was supposed to be seen, I walked out. I'm not going to wait any longer. I, don't, I get frustrated waiting in the lines at the supermarket. Anybody else feel that way? Vicki even, my wife is incredibly impatient. She told me yesterday, she was at a store and it was eight deep, and she thought, I'm out of here, and she left, and she didn't, she didn't wait. We all feel that way. We're sitting back thinking, listen, I don't want to wait this long. I don't like waiting at traffic lights. Anybody with me on that? I hate waiting at traffic lights. I got about 15 different ways to go home, and here's what I do. When I hit a traffic light, I turn, all right? I turn right or left, but I sit back and think, I am not going to waste my time sitting here for 30 seconds or 45 seconds waiting for this light to turn. I think I can make it faster a different way. Here's what I'm telling you today. I hate to wait. My impatience causes me to want to act. So whenever I read Scripture and I'm told to wait, it goes against my human nature. Here's what I want to do. I want to nudge God along. <laughs> I want to uh, push God. I want to make Him act. I want to look at Him and say, listen, are you coming or not? Because I'm moving forward whether you're with me or not. My... My impatience makes it super difficult for me to wait. I want God to act according to my timetable. Anybody resonate with that today? But that's not the way God acts. That's not the way that God responds. That's not the way that He works. He's not subjective to my schedule, nor is He subjective to yours. And we see that in the passage today. So if you're in Habakkuk, we're going to bounce around a little bit. Notice in Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. So as, as Habakkuk gave these two laments to God, God, why are you using wicked people to hurt people more righteous than them? And then, God, why are you not answering my prayers? Here was God's response to him. Habakkuk 2, 2. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tables, so he may run who reads it. That's a, an ambiguous phrase. It either means that the guy who's carrying the proclamation, the letter will be big enough that he'll be able to read it, or as someone is walking by and the proclamation is written there, they will be able to see it and understand it. Either way, all right, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. Notice what he says. If it seems slow, nudge it along. Is that what he says? 
If, if God doesn't act in your timetable, give Him a, a little push. Is that what it says? If it seems slow, what does He say to do? Wait for it. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. It will come when? In God's time and according to God's time table. He says, wait. Now, now here's what I want to flesh out today, and we see that in this passage. Waiting doesn't mean not doing anything. So waiting doesn't mean, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over, sit in a corner, I'm going to cross my legs, and I'm just going to wait until God does something. Give me a magazine, give me the TV control, I'm going to turn it on, and God, I'm just sitting back waiting on you. Waiting doesn't mean that we don't do anything. God's not telling us to sit in a corner and be patient until He is ready. No, to wait is to do something incredibly important. As a matter of fact, catch this today, catch this. I would say that waiting is one of the most important things that we do. That's tough, is it? That's one of those phrases that you don't get an amen from, right? If I talk about God is great and judgment, man, everybody's amen. But if I sit back and say, the most important thing that you can do is wait, everybody's like, yeah, I'm not sure I get that. I'm not sure I get that. But waiting is one of the most important things that we can do. So the question is this, what do we do while we are while we are waiting? When we're waiting for God to answer our prayer, when we're waiting for God to respond, when we're waiting for God to provide, what do we do? And Habakkuk gives us a response here. Go back to chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. This is where Brad left off last week, and this is part of Habakkuk's second complaint. But notice what he says in verse 12. He says this, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. We read this already. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? So, so here's what Habakkuk teaches us a really important lesson. What do we do while we are waiting? Here's what we do. Catch this. This is really important. You meditate on the character of God. While I am waiting, while you are waiting, here's what we do. We meditate on the character of God. In the midst of uncertain times, in the midst of a bleak future, in the midst of unanswered prayer, Habakkuk, he didn't sit back and say, okay, man, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm out of here, God. Look for a different prophet. Here's what he did. He contemplated the character of God. Notice the different phrases. He said, are you not from everlasting? What is he talking about? God's eternality, the fact that God is eternal. He said, O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One. What is he contemplating? God's holiness. He said, O oh Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. What is he thinking about? God's sovereignty. He says, O oh, you and you, O oh, rock. What is he talking about? God's stability. The theological term is God's immutability. The fact that he does not change. So whenever you don't know what God is doing, whenever the future is uncertain, stop and meditate on who you know God to be. Oh God, I don't know what you're doing. But God, this morning, I know you are good. God, you haven't answered my prayer, but God, I know you are gracious. God, man, I want you to do this, but God, I know you're merciful. I know you're kind. God, here is what I know about you. I know you're patient. And I go through and I contemplate on the character of God. Catch this, church. This is, so, this is so important. Whenever we focus our attention on what we're not getting, we doubt. But whenever we focus on who God is, 
we believe. Did you catch that? Whenever we focus on, I'm not getting this, this isn't happening in my life, poor me, pobrecito de mí, whenever we focus on that, it leads to what? It leads to doubt in our lives. But whenever we sit back and say, no, here's what I'm going to focus on. I don't know this, but what I do know is what God's Word teaches me about God. And I am going to meditate and I'm going to focus on His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His love, His omniscience, His omnipotence in my life. I'm going to focus on that. I am going to meditate on the character of God. And what happens in the midst of all of that, in the midst of uncertainty, what happens? Your faith grows. Instead of allowing doubt to grow, and instead of planting seeds of doubt in your life and in your heart, you sit back and you meditate on God's character. That's exactly what Habakkuk did. He meditated on the character of God. He did a second thing. Notice verses 13 through 17. I'll read him again. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. You who idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them up with a hook and drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his daughter, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly kill nations forever? Now you might read that like I did the first time and think, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> right? here's, what, here's what Habakkuk is doing in the midst of uncertainty. He's crying out for God's justice. He's sitting back and he's realizing, God, man, there is unjust things that are happening all around me. And in his figurative, allegorical language, he cries out for the justice of God. As you read through this, you might not have caught it, but, but Habakkuk's questioning is bold. Here's what he's asking. How can a holy, all-powerful to God, to whom sin is repugnant, Permit evil to go unchecked and unpunished. Did you ever feel that way? Did anybody else feel that way other than Habakkuk? We see injustice all around us. And we sit back and the question is, God, where are you? One of the great theological questions is the question of why does God permit evil? And we see that all around us and we wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? We see the genocide that exists around the world. We see poverty that exists in many third world countries. We see the lack of compassion even in our own country towards immigrants and towards the elderly and even towards veterans. And we sit back and say, God, we're crying out for justice. And in the midst of uncertainty, that's what we do. That's what the psalmist did. Notice Psalm 82, verses 2 through 4. I'll put it up on the screen. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. What do we see? Over and over again, we see God's people crying out for justice. So while Habakkuk was waiting, he didn't sit with his arms crossed, he meditated on the character of God. He cried out for justice. And by the way, I would tell you this, that the most powerful tool that we have as followers of Jesus Christ is prayer. Amen? <laughs> the most powerful tool... Sometimes we think our most powerful tool is to protest. Or our most powerful tool is to do this. And I'm not against protesting. I'm all for voting. We need to do all of these things. But I'm telling you today, as followers of Jesus Christ, the most powerful tool we have to affect change in our community, in our world, is prayer. And we seldom take advantage of it. And here's a back at crying out to God in the midst of injustice, crying out to God for justice. By the way, let me tell you something else about Habakkuk that's really interesting. So most of the Old Testament prophets were preaching prophets. So, so as you read through their prophetic books, you're actually reading sermons that they preached. 
Habakkuk is not a preaching prophet. Habakkuk is a praying prophet. I love that. That's deep and profound because as you read through this book, you're not reading sermons that he preached. You are reading prayers that he prayed to God. If you want to learn how to pray, learn how to pray from a praying prophet. So here's the third thing you do while you wait. The first thing is you meditate on the character of God. The second thing, you cry out for the justice of God. And here's the third thing, you patiently wait for a word from God. You patiently wait. Notice chapter 2 and verse 1. I love how, how Habakkuk paints this picture. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaints. Here's what he's saying. Patiently wait for a word from God. I love the determination of Habakkuk. He is, he is so determined to wait for an answer. He depicts himself as a watchman on a tower waiting for a word from God. Ironically, in Scripture, it is in the waiting that we find spiritual strength. Catch that. A lot, lot of times we think it's in the doing that we find spiritual strength. You know, we're out, we're serving, we're doing this, we're doing something, and that's where we're going to find spiritual strength. No, spiritual strength is found in the waiting. Notice what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, 31. I'm not sure whether I put it up on the screen or not. He says, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here's the challenge to you today. When God doesn't answer your prayer, what do you do? You wait. You wait on God. Have you learned to wait? Have you learned to sit back and be satisfied with a non-answer. And by the way, let me say this. So the, the title is just a little ambiguous because the title is, you know, when God doesn't answer prayer. And I would say this, God always answers prayer. The problem is that God doesn't answer prayer the way that we want it to be answered. So we want God to do this. We want God to provide this. We want God to do this. And when God doesn't do what we want, we sit back and say, hey, God, you're not answering my prayers. And some of the greatest answers to prayer I have ever received was no, where God says, no, that is not conducive for you. It's not best for you. Yesterday morning, as, as we were in our, our service, I told the Saturday morning crowd of when Vicki and I started our first church in Mexico City, we started with just a small group of people, and we went, met in what's called a salon de fiestas, which is just like a banquet room. That's where we started meeting in this banquet room. And uh, we started having Sunday services there. And as any church, we wanted to have our own church building. And it wasn't long that we found a piece of property right around the corner from our church building. Do you remember? We found this piece of property. It was perfect. I, I mean, it was in the right location. It, it was the right size for our congregation at that time. It even had a good price. And we sat back and said, this is it. This is exactly what God has for us. And we were praying, okay, God, we don't have the funds for this, so God, we're going to ask for you to provide the funds. And so we picked up the phone to our sending church, which was a great supporter of ours. And I don't think at that moment it was like $60,000 or $70,000. And we thought, man, you know what? Our home church can finance this. This is God. We are so convinced this is God we were praying and so we we sent in a proposal to our church these godly men who loved us confident this is exactly what God has for us and two weeks later we received a phone call saying no nah, I'm sorry we don't believe this is the best thing for you we're not going to support this it devastated me God wait a second wait we're serving you. We're starting a church in Mexico City. We're reaching people for Christ. We need a place to meet. This place is for sale. It's a reasonable price. Our church has the money to be able to finance it. We've cried out to you. And what's your answer? No. 
I was personally devastated for a while. It took me a little while to get over it, but guess what? It took us six years. But six years later, we found a piece of property that is so much better than that piece of property and went in and built a church that is so much larger than any church we could have ever built on that property. Guess what? God's answer was perfect at that moment. I didn't understand it. I actually thought it was wrong. And God gave us a no answer, and his no answer to me was what? It was the right answer. Listen, church, we serve a sovereign God who understands our lives so much better than we do. And if we're not careful, we pray selfishly and we want God to do this and that. And when he doesn't do it, we respond negatively to that. Failing to realize that we serve a sovereign God who knows what we need far better than we know what we need. And we just trust him. So he has us what? One of the most difficult places to be is in the waiting room, waiting for God to respond. You might be in the waiting room this morning. You might be sitting back saying, Brian, man, I, I, I get this. I've been asking God to do this in my life, and I've been praying for this, and it makes perfect sense to me. I don't understand why God is not responding, why God is not answering, why God is not providing, why God is not leading. Why isn't God responding? And quite frankly, he maybe already did respond. And in our obstinance, we fail to see what God is doing. And God simply says, wait. Because those who wait on the Lord, renew their strength. So in the midst of unanswered prayer, God's response to, to uh, Habakkuk was this. He said, wait. He gives him a second response, and we've already found it in verse 2. The second response was this. Live by faith. So the first thing was this. Wait on God. The second thing was live by faith. The Lord reminds Habakkuk that it is faith that will get him through the times of uncertainty, through the times of insecurity and unanswered prayer. When you don't understand what God is doing, when he's not answering your prayers, live by faith. Like we said in the beginning of the message, live like you believe it, even when you don't see it. Trust God. Live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. As a matter of fact, as we read it at the beginning of the message, you might sit back and thought, man, I think I've heard that verse before. This verse is used at least three other times in the New Testament as the New Testament writers took the truth of what Habakkuk was teaching and applied it to our lives. I want to show you the three other verses. So put your finger here in Habakkuk chapter 2 and go with me to Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul takes this truth that God gave to Habakkuk in the midst of uncertain times and the Apostle Paul takes it and actually applies it a little bit of a different way. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 he says this, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Then he says this, as it is written, who wrote it? Habakkuk. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, so Paul takes that verse, and here's what Paul is talking about. Deep theological truth. The apostle Paul is talking about justification by faith. He's talking about the fact that you and I are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That salvation is not based on our works. It only comes by faith and faith alone. You can't talk about Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 without talking about Martin Luther. Anybody familiar with Martin Luther? I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm talking about Martin Luther. I'm going to put a picture of him up there. Do we have a picture of Martin Luther? What a handsome looking dude, right? That's a, that's, a, that, that's a painting of Martin Luther. Martin Luther in the 1500s was a young man who was originally studying to be a lawyer. He wanted to be a lawyer. That's what his dad wanted him to be. And one day as he was coming back from the university, it was the University of Erfurt, he was almost hit by a bolt of lightning. 
A bolt of lightning strikes right beside him. In his, in his own biography, it talks about the fact that the strength of that kind of pushed him away, and he fell on the ground. As a result of that experience, he became terrified of death. And not only terrified of death, but he became terrified of judgment and actually meeting God. And he realized, I'm not ready to meet God. So Martin Luther, here's what he did. He left the university, he stopped studying as a lawyer, and he entered seminary thinking, you know what, if I become a priest, then all of a sudden I can satisfy God and I won't have to worry about judgment in the future. In his own testimony, he talks about the fact that even though he excelled in his studies, he still found no peace. And in his own words, he could never live righteous enough to satisfy God first and foremost and himself secondly. He made this statement. He said, more than 1,000 times I have promised God that I would change my life, but I have never kept my promise. We've talked about that as we've gone through sanctification. On the recommendation of one of his professors, he began reading the book of Romans. And he got stuck on this verse. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. And Martin Luther became convicted about the fact that justification, being made right with God, was not something that he did, but rather something that Jesus did for him, and he simply received it by faith. The lights came on for Martin Luther, and Martin Luther became a Christian, a follower of Christ. That's, by the way, that's not where the story ends, if you know the rest of the story. Although he was studying in a Catholic monastery, he began seeing some of the things that was taking place in the church, the indulgences that were being paid, how the church was demanding that people paid money in order to get their relatives out of purgatory. The, the saying back then was, when, when the coin in the coffer rings, or when the coin in the offering basket rings, a soul from purgatory springs. The idea being that, man, if you just paid money, you can get anybody you want out of hell. That's what the church was teaching. And as Martin Luther studied this passage, he realized, that's not right. Salvation doesn't come by paying for it. Salvation doesn't come by earning it. Salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it was on October 31st, 1517, that Martin Luther pins his now famous 95 thesis up on the church door at Wittenberg Cathedral. And that was the beginning of the Reformation. That's when Protestant, the Protestant church, officially began, when they began to protest, saying, wait a second, the church is saying that salvation comes through works, and we're sitting back saying, no, 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 salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And guess what verse it was that was the battle cry of the Reformation? It was Romans 1.17, which was a repeat of Habakkuk, Chapter 2 and verse 4. I would say today, if you're here today and you are trying to earn your salvation, if you're trying to be good enough and you're thinking coming to church is going to do it and maybe putting a little bit of money in the offering is going to do it, you can never be good enough. You can never pay enough. Salvation only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. The righteous shall live by faith. Paul quotes it a second time in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11 when he says this, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. I know you're following your outlines. I missed a point. Here's what it is. Righteousness is not actively achieved. It's passively received. Righteousness is not actively achieved. It's not something that we achieve. It's something that we receive by faith when we trust in Jesus Christ. Let me show you a second thing. My time's almost up. The last point is this. Not only are, uh, do we receive righteousness by faith, but you and I are able to persevere by faith. That's the meaning, actually, of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. God is telling Habakkuk to hold on. He's telling him to not lose hope. He's telling him to have faith. It is faith, he tells Habakkuk, that will get him 
This verse is actually translated in two different ways. And I'd venture to say if we took a poll of the audience, some of your Bibles translate it one way and some of them translate it another way because some Bibles say the just shall live by his faith, which is probably what many of your Bibles have. There are other translations that say this, the just shall live by his faithfulness. And you sit back and say, Brian, which is right? I don't know, I'm not a linguist. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. But I would give you two practical applications as a result of this. The first is this, have faith in God's plan. Even when you don't know what's going on, have faith in God's plan. When it seems like the world's going to hell in a handbasket, have faith in God's plan. When you're frustrated, even with the own leaders of our own country, have faith in God's plan. When you don't know what God is doing in your life, and it seems like you're walking in darkness, have faith in God's plan. The just shall live by faith, is what Habakkuk says. But it also means this, not only have faith in God's plan, but be faithful to God's purpose. Be faithful in the midst of uncertainty. Be faithful. The third time that Habakkuk 2.4 is quoted in the New Testament is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. I'll put it up on the screen. The writer of Hebrews says this, But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are those who have faith and preserve their souls. If you know the context of the book of Hebrews, the, those believers were suffering for the cause of Christ. It wasn't easy to be a believer during that time. And many of them had reverted back to Judaism. They had reverted back to their former way of living. And the whole purpose for the book of Hebrews is this. Hold on. You might not know what God is doing. Hold on. Don't shrink back. Be faithful to God's plan, even when you're uncertain what God is doing. The righteous shall live by faith. So when you have prayers that God doesn't answer, what do you do? You wait on God and you live by faith. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. For we walk by faith. Can you finish the verse? We walk by faith and what? And not by sight. Kind of lived this this week. So um, like any, any man my age, I get up quite a bit during the night. And so it's, it's easy for me at night. Man, I know the layout of our house. And so I don't have to have the lights on. I can get up at night and I can pretty much navigate all the way through our house. I know the plan. I'm, I'm good at it. So we were out of town and we were at a hotel this, this week. And all of a sudden I wake up in the middle of the night and guess what? I'm in a place that I don't know. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm having to navigate in the dark in a place that I don't know. And I get up out of bed and I'm kind of slowly feeling my way trying to get to where I'm going and at times I kind of bang myself just a little bit and you know I kind of make it there little by little and I sat back and thought boy what a great illustration of what life is for us that at times we live in a dark world and we don't know what God is doing. And we want God to come back. We want him to be on the throne. We want everything to be right, but that's not the way it is. And it's not going to be that way until he returns. And so until he returns, what do we do? We walk by faith and not by sight. We kind of feel our way step by step saying, okay, God, today, man, I, I'm going to take one step and I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to take another step, and I'm going to trust you. And each step I take with faith, trusting that you are guiding me in this step. And I might bang my leg on a piece of furniture, and I might slip and fall down. But God, that's okay. I'm going to get myself back up, and I'm going to live, and I am going to walk by faith. A life of faith. That's what God calls us to live. Whether we clearly see what he's doing, or whether we don't understand what he's doing. 
whether he answers our prayers or whether he doesn't answer our prayers. What's our response? We wait on God and we live by faith. We live it and we believe it even though as of yet we don't see it. We trust God to guide us. I'm, not, I'm certainly not a prophet. If I was, I'd want to be a praying prophet and not a preaching prophet, but I don't think it's going to get easier to be a Christian in our country. I don't think it is. I mean, there were even some quotes made this week about, and you know what, if churches don't toe the line of what we want, we're going to take away their tax-exempt status, and we're going to make them do and be what we want them to do. It's not going to get any easier to be a follower of Christ. As a matter of fact, it's going to get more difficult. So when it gets more difficult, what do we do? We went on God, we stand. <laughs> That's exactly, thank you, Steve. That was my third point. We don't have time to get there, all right? We trust God, and we're faithful, and we live by faith. So as Brad said last week, what do we do? We look up, trusting him. We wait on God. And we live by faith. That's the message of Habakkuk. Would you stand with me today as Jonas and our praise team come? So maybe you're here today and you have no idea what God's doing in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling with God because you've asked God to do something and as of yet, He hasn't responded. That's okay. Habakkuk struggled with God. It's not a sin to struggle and not understand what God is doing. But I would encourage you today to be willing to wait. So as, as we've said the last couple of weeks, man, we want you, the altar is not a place to be afraid of. It's a place just to come and spend some time in prayer. And so as Jonas and the team lead us, man, we, I would encourage you to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you about today. If you're here today and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'd invite you to do that. We'll have elders and, and deacons down front who would love to take the Word of God and show you how you can know for sure that you've trusted Christ by faith. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your Word. Help us like Habakkuk. Help us like Martin Luther. Help us like so many Christians through the centuries who have lived through dark and difficult times. Help us to look up, realizing that our future is in you. Help us to wait for you, realizing that your plan is better than ours. And help us to live by faith. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight and trust you to guide us each and every step of the way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.